So I wanted to go over something from Wednesday, which was, we talked about basically the fact that Monte Carlo and TD can achieve different values. And I used the word converge, and unfortunately there are two ways in which you could be using the word converging. And so, if we look at our x-axis, it's sort of time moving on and achieving more and more samples. As we achieve more and more and more samples, Monte Carlo and TD both converge, and they both converge to the same values. So these are our values, um, where we're talking about values with respect to a particular policy or optimal values. <coughs> the other way I want to look at convergence is let's look at a particular point in time. So at this point in time, what we have seen is a finite amount of samples, right? a finite number of samples. So let's just look at that finite number. So if this is, and I am sort of overusing this diagram, but let's kind of say we have all this data. So this is equal all of our samples, okay. our finite samples. If we look at training our Monte Carlo or our TD with those finite samples, what happens? If we look at Monte Carlo, so we've got this big batch of samples we've taken. If we look at Monte Carlo and train it, we really just train all the samples we've seen. If you look at Monte Carlo, right, doing it over again on the same batch doesn't make any sense. Once you've seen all of the samples, you're basically just taking averages of what you've got. And if you went and did it again, you would just duplicate every instance and you take the average of the same values duplicated. So there's no real convergence idea there. So Monte Carlo, we can either say doesn't converge, let's say it does converge immediately. Perhaps is the better way to say it. Because when we say it doesn't converge, that doesn't really give the right, the right impression there. Right? We just get a value with all our finite states, and this is some value we've got. This minimizes the mean squared error on the batch. Okay? That's what Monte Carlo does. It says, given all of the data I've seen for training, what, is, what are the values I can get that minimize my error? TD, on the other hand, actually does have convergence. So I look at it kind of like we're going to converge to some value function here. Why do we have the convergence? Because we've got this alpha factor, right, in terms of our step size. And if we uh, repeat the same episodes and the same samples, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to some particular value. Right? We'll converge on that value. The convergence will give us a different value than the Monte Carlo does. So this is the sense in which I want to say the convergence. Not the convergence over time as we have an infinite number of samples, but the convergence assuming at any point in time we stop and we say this is enough. What would happen if I just trained the TD on this? Now, yeah. Monte Carlo goes ahead and minimizes the, minimizes the mean squared error on the batch. What is TD going to be minimizing? Or what do we end up with? Uh, very good way to turn it around. Uh, does he know my answer or shall I? So it's going to minimize the weighted I'm going to say compute the maximum likelihood 
has to match. Of an MVP. That is, given the data that we've seen, and I'm putting this in quotes because it doesn't explicitly compute this, okay? But it computes the values that match the maximum likelihood Markov decision process. That is, the Markov decision process that most, most explains all of the data we've seen. Does the learning rate we use affect this at all? It affects the speed to convergence. But not the actual uh, convergence? Uh, In the same way the discount does. If you had, right, so if you have like a 1.0 or something like that, um, then you could definitely get some oscillations where you're not going to really converge well. Okay. So the example we gave was something like, right, you, you had an episode where you saw an A took an action, got a reward of zero, saw a B, and then got a terminal state. And this was the only episode we had where we ever saw an A. So Monte Carlo says, what's A worth? Zero, right? A is worth zero, because we've never seen an A that doesn't give a reward of zero. TD would say, yeah, but, We've seen a lot of Bs that give a 1, right? So in this case, right, and these are separate episodes, right? The Ts are terminals. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So here, TD would say, what's the value of B? What can I? No discount. We're we'll trying to make life easy. Good question, though. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter for B or A because we only ever visit B or A once. But I like the question, Jessica. Just one. One because. Because that is the only sample that we've gotten for B. Hold it. We have got eight sample. No, six samples, right? Four of them give us a one, two of them give us a zero. Oh, I didn't see this. Okay, yeah, they're, they're there too. So that would be then four plus six, so two thirds. And what does Monte Carlo say about this? The value of B. Yeah, I agree with you. It's the same, right? Now for A, Monte Carlo of A. I'll take that one and I'll say that's a zero. Uh, and now we get the question of TD of A. Uh, Shannon. It's also two thirds. Okay, it's also two thirds because we're going to be using the basically, you know, value of A equals our estimate function, right? And so basically what it's going to be doing is giving us the same value we'd have if. We had something like this. A always goes to B, and B goes to T. Two thirds of the time, you get a one, and one third of the time, you get a zero. Right? Does that make sense? Now, if we continue sampling, we continue moving. So, so this is this point in time. We saw six samples. And we said, OK, what happens? Monte Carlo has these values. TD, we let it converge. It'll get those values we see over there. And we can see they're quite different right? on A. But if we keep going and getting more and more and more samples, they're going to get closer and closer together. Because we know we're going to get some samples where A is 1. right? In fact, we'd expect 2 thirds of our A samples to end up with a 1. And so that's going to happen over time. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Sean? So I'm more behind you. Yeah, Monte Carlo does immediately converge to that data or does it? Monte Carlo converges immediately to a va to always to a value. Okay. Right? This is with the batch. So for any given finite set of samples, 
once you have fed those samples into Monte Carlo, it has a value. And it's not going to change if you fed those samples in again. Not true for TD, right? TD takes a while to converge with samples. Okay. So, in fact, as you're moving TD around, right, we saw we went ahead and converged this in here. As we're moving and getting more and more samples, we're never actually really stopping and converging at any given finite set of batches. We're going to keep. Um, what we'd say basically just approaching. We are converging, but we're using new samples for it. So it's kind of like we're doing a little spiral along. It's, yeah, it's sort of like this, I guess, is conceptually, is we're kind of doing this. If that makes sense. Can you explain again how you got TD value of A is equal to this? So there are two ways I can do it. One way I can do it is say, well, I know this maximum likelihood estimate. This is the best uh, estimate for what the uh, MDP is. And so therefore, I know the value. The other way we can, well, actually, how did you do it, uh, McKenna? For the MC value? For this one. Or did you know, Shannon, you did this one. Never mind. Yeah. Um, are we talking about this last class? We did, yes. So, um, so let's just look at what is our update rule for TD. That would be our best way to look at it. Right? Our update rule is, right, this is plus equals alpha times R plus gamma. We'll just leave that at 1 right now. Right? V of B. Why am I saying via B? Uh, because we're never, we only had one instance of this, right? This is it. This is what it's going to look like. So actually, what's the R going to be? Shannon? Mm, zero. Right. So it's going to be 0 plus V of B minus V of A. So when we start, V of A is, I don't know, 1,000? Let's just say B has gotten to where it needs to be. Okay? So. Uh, we will reduce this and reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Let's say it gets to 1. So we have alpha times 2 thirds minus 1. So that's still negative. So it's going to go down. So basically, if our estimate of A is above 2 thirds, this whole thing will be negative. And so it will reduce. And if V of A is below 2 thirds, then this estimate will be positive, and so it will increase. Does that explain that, Dave? Uh, I guess I still don't understand. Well, first, I don't understand about why V of B is in that equation. Here's the reason. Because right, if we think of the TD, so let's look at We take a step, right? So let's look at it here. This is our backup diagram. We're in SA. We take a step. We get a reward. We have a new state. And then we have a new A prime, right? Uh, that's not what I want, because this is the Q function, and I'm looking at the V function. So let's change it. Trying to keep my hands as clean as possible and not have an eraser. No wonder my hands are so dirty. Open S A S prime N R. Right? So we basically take a step and we're now going to update the value of this state based on the reward we get and the value of the new state. If what we're trying to update is A, the only time A ever appears in here, right? We're going to do a lot of updating of B, but the only A that's going to get updated is this one. And so therefore, and the next state is B. So S prime is B. The reward is 0 here. That's why we have the 0 and the B. Yeah, OK? So uh, I have a question about Take. how you do, um, update the values. Like, if you have a really long um, episode, you like, go backwards. Do you update like, on each time step that you go backwards? We don't go backwards. Here's what we do. We're going to, let's, so let's, 
Does anyone need this diagram? Because I'm going to go ahead and remove it right now. And I'm going to go right on to the SARS algorithm. Um, All right, it, it may be interesting to find the values of states, but we really want the values of actions because we want to know what to do. Okay. So the SARSA, state action reward, state action, right, says at any given time step, we've got a state and we've got a potential action. We add to it alpha times the reward at the next step, of course plus our discount factor, our Q of the next state, our action of the next state, minus Q of S right? The format of all these is always the same. Right? The only interesting thing is, what is our target? Right? This whole thing is our error. What's our target? And in this case, the target is going to be we're going to take our immediate reward, and we're going to look at the next state action pair, discount it. That's our target. So, get back to your question. We're in a state. We take an action. Sorry. We have a state action we're about to do. So we, we take this state action. Okay? And that gives us a reward and tells us what new state we're in. So I was in this state. I moved to the right. I got a reward of some sort. I see now I'm in this new state. And that's almost enough to go, but not quite. Because now I need to know, what am I going to do in this new state? So I moved to the right. I got a reward. Now I need to actually take another action. And then I can say, OK, for that state action pair, what's its value? So if I've got 10 actions in a row that's going to happen, I'm going to take the first action. And then as soon as I take the second action, I can back up and update that first state action pair. And then when I take the third action, I can back up and update the second state action pair. And that's what I'm going to do. There's one step at a time looking back. This is not quite the picture, because this is the picture for value functions. Here for SARSA. Right, it is. We have a state in action. We get a reward. We're in a new state. We take a new action. Okay, so we're going to update this value based on this reward and the value of this. Sure. Question about how the backup diagram is drawn. Like, why do you not just also draw the state as a circle in, instead of putting it as a table for the first one? Because then it would be unclear what we are updating. So if I had, I think your question is this: Why don't I start with that? Yeah. And the reason is because the top of the backup diagram tells us what we're updating. So if the top of the backup diagram is an open circle, we're updating v. Right, we're updating the state value. If the top is a closed-in circle, that is, it's a state and action pair, then we're updating the Q. This is Q. And this one is V. And it would be ambiguous otherwise. You had a question still? Oh, sorry. So in, in the uh, example that you did earlier, if you had like just these with the have ones, and then you have the A episode, it would have been one, not two thirds. Almost. So let's say this was one. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're gonna we're gonna have a counterfactual. We'll change this one to one. If that were the case, then a would not still be one because there's still a zero here. If we change this one to one as well, then yes. And we can also account for what if this transition has its own reward, right? And that would be this one changing. So just first a quick clarification. Michael and uh, TD are both 
the model three cases where we don't really have any sense of the environment of the system. These are both um, model free. Monte Carlo is episodic. TD need not be. I see, but if, I guess if it's continuing, um, we have some sense of rewards. It's not like a lot of the problems with that we've been working with where our rewards only happen once we reach a terminal state. The TD. Yeah, TD is not. We basically, we're not waiting until we get to the end to see what our total return is. We're just looking one step at a time and saying, I got a reward. I know what the new state is. Let me use my estimate of that state plus my immediate reward. Yeah, I guess that was one of the confusions of last class for me was when we were working with the maze example. Uh, we were kind of introducing TV as something to help avoid the consequence of Monte Carlo of having to wait for determinate episodes. Yes. Um, but I guess there's plenty of cases where we don't have like zero reward transitions for the majority of the MVP. You know, we have non-zero transitions for uh, it's certainly true that lots of, uh, so the case where you have most, mostly zeros is called a sparse, it's a, a sparse MDP, sparse reward mm -hmm. environment. Sparse reward environments are difficult. Okay. Which in fact, you should remember from day one, as you were wandering around and going to the back, it's like you were getting nothing, right? Very difficult to know what they have to do. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, so I guess. The other the main questions I have are um, the order of updates seems to have like some, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't change the final values that you converge on, but maybe it might change what happens throughout the process. Um, and also designating rewards. Uh, the nice thing about a sparse reward um, MVP is that you don't need to think too hard about it. It feels like a weak method, um, which seems pretty important. Uh, an important principle of RL that like we only want to reward for things that we're like absolutely sure about. So mm. uh, it's, it's I think I would describe it less reward only what you're sure about and more reward what you want, not proxies for what you want. Okay. If if that makes sense. So reward winning chess, don't reward taking pieces. So would that still be? You know, yay! I got eight of his pawns. I lost, but, but I got eight of his pawns, and he only got three of my pieces or something. Go ahead. So with that, with the chess game, there still be like a sparse MVP? That is extremely sparse, because you play for 40 moves, and then you get a reward. Yeah, and that's a, is a key example. So do example. we not use like TD? No, yeah, we would use TD for that. Exactly. Uh, backgammon, as I mentioned, is, is, is the game in which TD was first really very successfully used. Uh, along with a neural net. And that is another example of a sparse reward. Mm -hmm. It's not until the end of the game. Mm -hmm. so, so those are very much unlike, let's say, um, um, video games where you've got a score that is going up. Right. So, sorry, but last one. Go ahead. Back minute, like, could you at least extend the rewards to be like every piece that's taken out and not just like once you win? You could, and you will get behaviors that you don't want. So you will get, you can easily train your agent to uh, win the battles but lose the war, right? I got some really good pieces from him. Yeah, I mean, he won in the end. But I got some really good pieces, and I got rewarded for those. So, um, go kind of related to that question. So like, instead of just setting that as one, like, um, for example, taking out pieces at first, then you can like switch your reward. Model. Okay, so that's shaping behavior. That that'd be a shaping or curriculum learning, right? That's this idea of train it first to take pieces, and then say, okay, now I am not going to reward you anymore for taking pieces. I am rewarding you for winning, but you have learned already some uh, how to take pieces. So that would then be an idea of moving the having a non-stationary MVP, where you are changing the rewards. Uh, and that's actually a very good way to do things. I mean, and that's how you learn, right, as a, as, a, as, a, as a human in the world often, or if you're teaching a baby or something else, right, it's not all or nothing. So, um, you know, I'm gonna give you gold stars along the way and not wait until you actually graduate from mud 
to say, hey, guess what? Here's a big reward. I know I didn't give you anything since kindergarten, but good job. Uh, I was going to ask, like, so is Chi generally for like, very long um, episodes better than That's the other advantage of it, can be, unless you have this very sparse reward, but yeah. So not only is there the fact that if it doesn't end, you're in trouble, but if you have long episodes, TD can be learning along the way, right? It can be updating every single step uh, as you want. Yeah, that's definitely an advantage. Sorry, I think I missed it. You said for sparse environments, which one do you want to use? Uh, So it depends. It'd be nice if we could like have something in the middle sometimes between Monte Carlo and TD. And that's what we'll start talking about on Wednesday. Um, so like much of this, it depends. Certainly what we do know is if you have a continuing task, don't use it Monte Carlo. You'll learn that waiting for your first steps. Sarsa. Sina, on policy or off policy? Okay. I like it enough. I'm going to write it up here. Why? Um, because we're like updating. Like we're not using like two separate policies, right? Like we're following a policy and then after we take that action and have a state action pair, then we continue to update and then continue to use. Yeah. Let's look at our sources of stochasticity, right? Or randomness here. What sort of randomness? So I'm in a state. I take an action. That's pretty determined, right? I mean, I have an ST, I have an AT. State, take, have it in a state, take an action. I get to a new state, I get a reward, I take a new action. Where's the randomness in there? The new action, well, I guess. OK, let's, I like that one, new action. Where's, where's that coming from? That would come from your policy. Okay, so this comes from, let's say, pi. And then the new state comes from the environment. So this comes from the environment. And I guess the reward. I like it. Yeah. Coming from? <laughs> the environment also. Yeah. Okay. So basically, URSA is random, right? The saw is fixed, but the rest of it is random. So SARSA does two things. SARSA is sampling from both the environment, right? I take an action, I see where I ended up, I see my reward. And also is um, sampling from the policy, because that's controlling what our new action is. Why not Go ahead, just, uh, uh, Just hold that thought for a moment, okay? Because that's a good idea. So what we're doing basically is, if we look at here, we've got randomness there, and we've got randomness here, right? As we look at taking more actions, right, the policy is controlling this. And so we're going to eventually, in expectation, get the weighted average over all possible actions. Right? Does that make sense? Using our random sampling. Because if we draw from our random sample, we're going to be drawing from our policy. And that's going to be giving us, eventually, all the possible actions we might take weighted exactly according to the policy. But we've got these two forms of randomness happening. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain that part again? Okay. So we're in state S, action A. We take action A. We get a random R and a random S prime based on the environment, and based on P, R and D, which we don't know, and we may never know what those values are. 
but the environment implicitly has some key there. And then we're going to take another action. How do we know what action this is going to be? It's determined by the policy. So this is probabilistic according to the policy. So there are several different actions we could have possibly taken. We took this action with probability pi of SD plus 1, AT plus 1. Right? So the probability here was pi of ST plus 1, AT plus 1. Right? And so as we draw more and more and more, we're going to get these next actions that uh, converge towards our probabilities. Doesn't that we probably have some sort of like a generalized policy variation as well? Um, and if we're changing the policy uh, in concurrence with like, you know, reevaluating each of our state action pairs, do we lose that um, guarantee, that an expectation? Like it's, it's hard to say that an expectation we follow the policy when the policy is changing. Um, well, so we can look if we're changing the policy. Yeah, so every time our expectation will be whatever, we will in expectation be getting whatever the current policy is. As that policy is changing, you're right, that expectation will change, but we will still converge because the policy is going to converge. Mm -hmm. so. um, so let's look at that idea of a weighted average of trying to reduce one source of randomness here. Because we can reduce one source of randomness because we know pi. That, we're in charge of that, right? Or we're given it or something, but we, 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 we have the policy. We have to have the policy because we are you know, rolling dice to take these actions. So expected SARSA. says, let's first look at the backup diagram. We have a state action pair. We take that action, we get a reward, we get an S prime, but then we look at all our possible actions. And whenever we have molt a fan out from here, that always means take a weighted average. So expected SARSA, we are going to modify this guy. Okay. So it's going to be Q of STAT plus equals alpha times RT plus 1 and times our gamma. And now we're going to do a weighted sum. So a summation over A's of, well, our Q value, which, so, so I move to the right, I'm in this state, and now I say, well, with probability 25% I might move forward, and 30% to the right, and 20% to the left, and so on, and I know the values for taking each of those actions from this state, and so I will link them together. So from state T plus 1, take this A. I've got to weight it though. So I've got to multiply that by the probability of actually taking that action. Which may very well be zero for particular policies. And then subtract off our old Q value. So only thing that changed, right? which is what is the value of taking the next action. And in the first case, we said, well, let's just say the next action is the one we take. And this one says, let's just look at all the things you could have done and what their probabilities are. And take those. Okay. So I understand why before, uh, when we were doing D values and the first star set, why it was on policy. But it occurs to me for this expected SARSA, 
why would it have to be on policy? It seems like off policy works just as fine for that for updating the Q values, as long as we're using I to do the weighting. All right, so you're saying it, you think it could be on policy or off policy? Could be expected, sir. We know this one has to be on policy because we're implicitly using the, we're using the policy to choose this, this action. So on policy, off policy. Let's address that in just a moment. So, but I did write it down. So that's a good sign. So let's talk a bit about what expected SARSA does. Expected SARSA updates, like this update here, in a, let's call it a deterministic direction. Which is the same as regular SARSA's direction and expectation. What do we mean by direction? Well, I, I really actually mean not just a direction. I mean like a vector, the place that we're going. Here is going to be of a certain uh, sign and magnitude, right? So if this one is high weight and a negative value, and these are all low weights, but a positive value. In expectation, sorry, not in expectation, as, as our weighted average, we're going to go to this negative value. In SARSA, in expectation, we're also going to that negative value, but any particular time we do it, it may either be one of these big negative ones or a positive one. So we're going to be kind of jerking around, as I showed you, that we're jerking around. Much less jerky, much less variance as we're doing the expected SARSA. Basically, we'd say expected SARSA is better. Is there any cost? Daniel. Um, it, uh, I don't think it should be much more difficult to compute. I, I don't think so. Yeah, the, I mean, the only case I can imagine is you have lots of potential actions. Maybe this becomes expensive. All right, um, and you know you're going to have to write in Python 80 more characters probably uh, to make this work. So uh, that's really it. It's it's a tad more complicated, and it may take some more time to execute. But it gives you these benefits of you're moving in um, more directly to where you want to go. Can you see why they end up the same, that this is an expectation? Because we're really just sampling from these actions according to the probabilities. And that's exactly the same thing as taking our weighted average. And, but, and we can do that because we know pi. The problem, of course, with this transition is you would need the model for that. And that's exactly what we did in dynamic programming. We said, let's just go ahead and take the weighted average. And now we're having to, to emulate that with our, with our uh, in expectation by taking samples. Wait, sorry, you just now you said you would need the model? If yeah, you would need the model going from the state action pair to the state. So to get the reward in the new state, you would need the model. When we did dynamic programming, we also did, we removed that expect, we didn't have that expectation there. We went ahead and did the weighted average only because we had the model. Okay. But, but we don't have it here, so yeah. we still got this randomness. Can't get rid of it. But rather than waiting until the next action to update your previous state action pair, you're just waiting until your next state to update your state. That is also a good point, is, right, I'm here, I move to the right, I don't have to wait to actually take a new action in order to do this update. I can just say, I'm here. Conceptually, what are all the possible actions? Wait them. I know all of the corresponding Q values. Okay. That's what we're doing. That's the 
That's the expected. That's the expected. Yeah. Now I guess a downside of TD overall is every time you change the policy, you have to redo everything, or can you run on the? No, actually, you can probably run on the same episode. You just have to recompute everything, right? Yeah, Unlike like Monte Carlo, where you don't have to even rerun on your previous batch. Monte Carlo just keeps. Mon Monte Carlo just has remembered the average like, of everything yeah, it's seen. It remembers everything that you see, so even if you change the policy, that shouldn't be fine. Right? No, I mean, well, remember, when, right, when we use Monte Carlo, if we change the policy, we need to use the importance sampling. That's what that would be. Yeah. Okay. Taking away some isn't it? Better to just take a max over all the possible options. Okay. So this is nice. I don't have to refer to my card that gives me the order in which to do things because you just generate. <laughs> you all. So what about taking a max? I am going to get back to this off policy question a little bit later. So let's say. Let's just give it a name, Q learning, right? And let's say the only thing that's going to change again is the, the part with the gamma, right? The discounted value. So we have Q of STAT plus equals RT plus one plus gamma. It's like what you seem to be saying is forget the expectation. Why would we take bad ones? Why would, why would we go on this negative one? Like I don't like that one. I like the one that's a positive. So just take a max. Max overall A, Q, ST plus 1A. Uh, do I need a pi here? No. No. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't care what the probabilities are. I, if I've got something very unlikely but good, I like that one, right? Minus. I suppose we need a. Does that make sense? So, well, okay, so first off, let's do a backup diagram for this one. We're starting at S comma A. We take an action. We go to a new state. There's a bunch of different possible actions. But we want the max. Yep. So this signals the max as opposed to the weighted average. So when we are drawing our initial action, our very part AT, we're still following a policy that's not necessarily greedy, but this has in mind that our final policy will be greedy. So we are clearly constructing a greedy policy here, <coughs> right? I guess the question is, like, do we still sample in So, yeah, let's 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 get to that. So we're going to approximate Q prime if we do this enough. Um, And here we can be off policy okay, as well. We're, um, so we're going to end up with a greedy, uh, a greedy policy here. And the question is, what are we using for explore? Let me bring up the windy, windy grid world. So we have a start state, we have an end state, we have a bunch of states in the middle. Uh, it costs us negative one on every transition, okay? Except, sorry, this is not Winnie Grid World, this is Cliff World. Let's we'll call it Cliff. All of these are negative 100. I go back to the beginning. So this is the cliff. If you go off the cliff, it costs you negative 100. But this is a deterministic environment. So it's not like a windy cliff or anything. It's like if you walk right along the edge here, you won't fall off as long as you don't turn right. So let's say we use Sarsa. So let's use different colors. So we'll make this one be red for Sarsa. All right. 
So we'll have an epsilon greedy policy that we're using. Let's just say epsilon equals uh, 0.1. All right. And the question is, what policy is it going to learn? Uh, first off, we do go up from here, and we go down from here. They will learn that. Let's look, for instance, here at this state. I'm going to call this the this is going to be the square state. So we have a square state and a diamond state. Okay, I'm going to use this rather than naming them. So those are their names, so to speak. So I'm in the square state. If I go up, I know I'm going to go up to here. But let's say I go to the right. What is going to happen to the value of the square state if I go right? Right, it's going to be plus equals alpha times the reward of minus 1, which is my reward, plus, this is SARSA, so I'm going to just go ahead and use the, time, the, the triangle state. Triangle uh, well, not just the state, it's the state action pair. So I need to look, so actually I can't even determine this yet. I need to d decide what happened. I need to look and see what happens from the diamond state, from the triangle state, right? So it's like I was here, I moved forward, and now in order to decide what it's worth here, it's a combination of the state and the action. So most likely, what action would I probably take? Assuming I have a reasonable policy. Probably over to here, towards, towards the end, right? So we might have, let's say, uh, a 90% chance of going right. And a, you know, 2.5% chance of left and right, sorry, that's an up, left, and the bad one of down. Okay. Which of these am I going to get? I don't know. But I know it's 90% likely it's going to be a right. But if I go down, I probably already learned that going down from here is not good. Right? It's at best negative 100. So the value of this is negative 100. So 90% of the time, I might choose going right. A little bit of the time, I'm going to choose going down. If I choose going down, it's going to be really bad. In expectation, it's going to be whatever this weighted sum is. Okay. Which is going to be, what, this is negative 100 times 2.5%. And this is, what, negative 1 times, sorry, this is... These are all less than negative one, because we know it costs us an immediate negative one just to move. So this is all going to be not very good, right? By that argument, going right here is not all that great. Going right is going to be a lot better than going down. But going right is not great. Going left is worse than going right. Going up is better than both of those. And the epsilon greedy algorithm is going to basically learn that this is a good policy. The optimal policy is if I am very shaky when I'm by the edge of cliffs and often tend to go off them, then I should stay away from cliffs. So that's what it's going to learn. Optimal for this policy, not the optimal policy. Does that make sense? So, sorry. Optimal for being an epsilon greedy, point 0.1 epsilon greedy policy. If you removed epsilon down enough, it could go ahead and walk near the edge. So, um, this kind of goes back to what we had.
before when we were done with the early homework started discussing do we want to count exploratory steps when we're updating our own policy. And what we have now is if our policy is greedy, then that ratio, the important sampling ratio, would probably just be zero um, for those exploratory steps. And for Monte Carlo, yes. Right. And then if we, so then this key learning is essentially exactly the expected SARSA. Off policy Sorry, this one is SARSA. I'm going to distinguish this from the expected SARSA and the Q learning. Okay. Well, okay. Could, could we have a connection between the off policy Q learning and the off policy expected SARSA where A of T is generated by an off policy, but we still do the expectations just that pi is. The that's exactly what we're getting to, basically. Yeah, that's exactly. So, so now let's look at off policy. We're going to have our exploring policy is going to be epsilon soft. I don't really care what else it is. Right? It's epsilon soft. And let's just go to the Q learning. So our learn policy is going to be greedy. So When we're going from here to here, in Q, so let's use a different color, which is black, let's say. So black is going to be Q learning. Okay, so for Q learning, which takes the max, we have the same interesting question. So what happens if we go from here to the right, and that's going to be plus equals plus the important thing, which is our max over A of Q of triangle A. Yes? Okay. So here, we don't care about the probabilities, do we? We don't care about the probabilities. We're going to just look and say, which of these is better or worse? This one's clearly bad. Right? That's going to be the worst possible choice. Left is going to be worse than right. Right? You could just imagine that it's going to be worse being over here than it is here. And similarly, it turns out up is going to be worse than right. Because basically, we're going to come up with a policy that's deterministic, that says if you're near the cliff, I don't know, let's try not going down. Okay. And so the Q learning is going to learn a different policy, which is now I want to distinguish what happens in your episodes versus what is the policy that you have learned. If your episodes are being generated by this epsilon soft policy, maybe it's even still epsilon greedy. Okay? So maybe it's epsilon greedy using the policy you learned here, the optimal black policy. If you run your epsilon greedy policy with this black policy, sorry, if you make an epsilon greedy version of the black policy, it's not going to do well. Because every so often, it's going to throw itself off the edge. The policy we were learning that we are optimizing is different from the policy that we're using from exploration. And the key part about our Q learning here, where we take this max, is it doesn't matter who's generating this um, single step. It doesn't matter what policy was used to say if you're in state S and take action A, you get this reward and end up in this new state. Okay? And then it's not governed by any policy. What you just said, if, you're, if the reward and next state are governed by the bar. So. so this, what gets returned is independent of the policy. Oh, that's what you yeah. yeah. And we don't care who generated this state and this action. 
in terms of doing this update for our greedy policy. Okay? It's just information that's being provided, basically, about the environment. It's samples from the environment. And it could be an epsilon greedy policy that's doing the sampling. It could be any epsilon soft policy. You could have a random policy as well, if you want. Okay? It would learn as quickly as an epsilon greedy version of this Q function because it would be spending its time doing random shit, right? Rather than mostly doing what you're interested in. Do we still have a Nope. We don't need it because, remember when we're saying Q of SA, let's say here, Q of SA, that says starting in state T, taking action at AT, and then following our policy. And so, um, so by taking at the next date that we get to, what's the best action to take? We're sort of, I don't know how quite to describe it, we're um, just step at a time building up our policy from actions, nothing in here depends on that we are following our policy. It just builds up from anyone exploring our environment from a state taking an action, finding out the new state and new reward. Okay. So if I'm understanding correctly, since Q learning, the update rule does not depend on the policy itself. Uh, the point of having an all policy is more for the exploration so we would visit other states and have a better estimate. That's right, the reason you would do off policy is for exploration, okay. mostly. Yeah. Expected SARSA as well, there's no dependence on the policy. There's no dependence on the policy that is generating the episode. Here, there's clearly a dependence on the policy generating the episode because how, do we, how did we know what action to take here? We only knew what action to take here from the policy that generated it. So this is dependent on the policy that we are using for behavior. And that's why this is a non-policy algorithm. But here, we could do this expectation with whatever policy we wanted. And it doesn't have to be the policy that is generating our behavior. Then why can't you do the normal source with any policy? The reason you can't do the normal source with any policy is We have this new action that is happening. How do we know what action it is? So in order to calculate the value of this state in action, we need to know what the next state in action are. So you choose that state in action based off the off policy that you're following. If we based it on the off policy, then you're saying how we're moving in the environment depends on the off policy. And in that case, it's an on policy. But in that case, can you just use, so if you learn Q, S, T, A, A, T based off the off policy, and use like weighted importance sampling to get back to the original. You could, yeah, so you could use weighted importance sampling. We're going to look at extent, we're going to look at this, this end step TD on Wednesday, where we actually, instead of one step like in uh, TD and all of the steps in Monte Carlo that we have something in the middle and we will have to get back to the important sample here. Yeah. So just to summarize, regular SARS regular SARSA is on policy. Regular SARSA is on policy. Expected SARSA is both on and off. Yeah, it could be used either way. Machine learning um, uh, you would, yeah, be, because you want some exploration, you need some epsilon, uh, some epsilon soft explore, uh, behavior policy. And because of that, because the Q learning always creates a deterministic policy, it doesn't have any exploration. And so therefore, it would be off policy.
questions? Other questions? So I'm going to erase this and go on to one more topic. And that is maximization bias. Let's look for instance here. Okay. That max over all A of Q S T A. That gives us, based on what we know, which action has the highest Q value, right? Not only which action has the highest Q value, but our estimate of what that value is. But we're really doing two things. We're really saying here, one, get the best A, and two, get an estimate for Q of, I'm going to just call this problem, A. My claim is this is a biased estimate. Okay? And it's a biased estimate because, let's just do an example. So, on the website for today, you can click on a, there's a spreadsheet, tiny or tinyurl.com rl max bias. Groups of two or three. I'm going to bring this up right now and I'll explain what I want you to do. So, what happens? I was going to write this app for this and then I realized the spreadsheet would be like a thousand times easier. So, we have five actions, all right? And there's a certain mean and standard deviation friction for each action. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell you the mean is zero. Okay? So, the mean of every action is zero. This is uh, like a. Uh, Bandit problem. Okay? And so what I want you to do is just if you copy this row, actually if you do much of anything to the spreadsheet, it'll re-roll the dice. So you can see each row is changing over time. But I have a very elaborate formula that will choose the maximum for each of these five values. Okay? So what I want you to do is in these groups of two or three. Compute the average max value okay, of 100 rows. So take 100 rows, uh, copy them, don't do them one by one. You know, copy one, select 100, paste, it'll base them in all. Calculate this average, and then calculate the average of all the action values. And let's look at the difference. Go. Does it make sense what we're doing? Oh, and you're going to also have to copy, you're going to have to make a duplicate of the spreadsheet. Because uh, it's read only. I think what you say is who's driving. And then the other people could be backseat drivers. So you could be not in charge. Move your mouse up just a little bit. Yeah, a few pixels to the left. <laughs> Okay, I give you 96 seconds to do this. Yeah, you did. There you go. Oh, uh, I think. Yep. Oh, just write it. H6. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, average. 
So hit the average, the function name is average, all spelled out. Okay, 37 more seconds. No, just do them all. Because I'm telling you, they are all the same. Okay. 22 seconds. And if you don't like the numbers you get, refresh the screen and you'll get new ones. <laughs> All right, so. Average max. Who's got an average max for me? 5.4. Thank you. Yeah. 6.2, all right. One more? 8.5, I don't believe that one. All right, and the average overall? Negative 0.1. Negative 0.4. 0.4. Negative 0.07. Negative 0.07, that's enough. We got two negatives, two positives. <laughs> and the average is very close to zero, uh, just like we want. Right, because all these numbers are drawn from a mean of zero with a fairly large standard deviation, and so you'd expect you average them all, you get something around zero. Some negatives, some positives. Did we get any negatives here? No. Did we even get any like close to zero? It's like we got all these extreme values. Why do we get extreme values? Because that's what we chose for. We said for every single row, give me your most extreme high value. It is not a very good estimate of the action, the value for that action. Because I mean, we're, we're, we're guaranteed to be biased because we are choosing the maximum over all of them. It is right, another way we could look at it is right, if we've got a bunch of um, confidence intervals, something like that, we As we are choosing, right, we may accidentally get a low one here, and a low one here, and a low one here, but a high one here, right, and a middle one here. And so we're going to take this extreme one, even though that's not representative of its actual value. If we chose this guy to be the maximum, it should sure be nice if we could somehow say, and this is our estimate of what his value is. Yeah. So one thing that we that we all have with our, our, our value functions is that it has like, a subscript of policy. So is it okay to say that it's not biased if we're um, doing Q of the green policy pi? No. Because uh, we still have a maximum, right? It doesn't help that we put in a, a pi here or not. We've got estimates, right? We have samples, we have random values, and what we're saying is be biased towards a higher number than the true averages. So we want what we think is the highest action, but we want a good estimate for that highest action. Does, does, that, does what we want make sense? Is it, does, does it make sense from looking at the spreadsheet as why we, we ended up biased towards the maximum? Yeah. Thing. Is, is it unbiased, like, is, isn't it an unbiased estimate of the optimal Q values? Nope. It's, it's, it is pushed high. So this is called maximization bias. And there's a very simple solution. And the simple solution is use one estimate to determine the maximum action and have a separate estimate for what its value is. Okay. So the idea is this. 
we look, so I don't know if this was clear, let me mark these. So we had these confidence intervals and I had this and this and this and this and this, and the high one was the red one, right? And now I want to come up with the blue estimate for it, a, a really a good mean for that one. So we will have two estimates. We're going to have Q1 and Q2. Independent samples. Okay? They're independent samples. So we can go ahead and use this to use the argmax to find the maximum A. Once we found the maximum A, which is like 1, 2, 3, 4, then we'll use a different estimate to say, OK, what is the value of SA? Let me show you the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is with dupe at the end. Um, so the idea is a little big. So let's say we have this row and what I'm going to do, I'll just do, I'll just do it here. Okay. So we have it. Why did it not work? Hmm. I thought that worked. Fine. We've got four. So we have the maximum from the left, right? The 2 and the 8 and the 1 and the 8, right? And then we say, OK, what's the argmax max of that? So this is the fourth guy, right? And this 8 is the third guy, and so on. And now I have, on the right-hand side of the spreadsheet, some other samples, fraction 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, taken from the same distribution, OK? So they just happen to be different values, right? But they're all same distribution. So if I now look at whatever the argmax for this one was, I don't remember what it was, four, I think. So if I take what is the fourth value over here, it's negative two. This is now an independent estimate of action four and what its value is. So I'm separating these two problems. Get the best A versus get an estimate for it. And this guy is unbiased. Right? I just have a bunch of samples. They're totally independent from the samples I used for this. And so as we look at these, you can see some are negative and some are positive. It wasn't as beautiful over here as two negative, two positive. But clearly, we are not biased. We don't appear to be, after four samples, biased positive. So what we'd end up with is, if we looked at the average of these, they would end up as zero. You had a question, Dan? Yeah. OK, so once you're uh, done training, then do you want to Calculate your policy based off the maximum. So, or the estimated values. What would happen? Let's let's first look at how we train this. Basically, you know, with probability 0.5, we are going to update Q1. Right. So we've got a given sample. We're going to update Q1. And it's going to be, you know, plus equals gamma, RT plus 1. And then the interesting part here, alpha of, let's just use, uh, 
um, sorry, we're using uh, Q-learning with our max. So here now, instead of doing a max, we've got to basically get the arg max of QT plus one A, and that will give us the index, and then we put that inside Q2, and it gives us an estimate. So first get what is the action we think is the best, and then get an unbiased estimate of that action. Minus And sorry, so this is a Q1 here. Arg max Q2. So Q1 gives us our arg max. Q2 gives us our unbiased estimate. Otherwise, it's Q2, Q1, Q2. Right? Otherwise identical. And so what we use, we, just, we could just use the sum of them if we want for our greedy. So the spreadsheet, feel free to go look at the spreadsheet again. There's a link to it from the lecture page. Look at the, this one and get up and feel why it is that this is fixing the problem. But really just think of it as a separate estimate. This, this like, for example, we don't really have something that's really off. The call of the actions are the same. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. Yeah. These, these ones happen to all be the same and make it clear why some of them should just be really high. But if we still want to use that uh, on policy, like how would we get like two samples at the same time? If we're using on policy, so we don't need two samples at the same time. Right? What we are doing is having two Q values and we're up. So we're keeping a shadow set of Q values. That's basically what we're doing. Of course, we're losing half of our samples. Because each one can only go to one or the other. Can't go to both, because if it, you know, if it goes to both, then they will no longer be independent. All right, see you on Wednesday. So the program assignment number four is out. Um, just be warned that in you know, all the previous ones, Right, I did it, I created a solution, and I removed small parts. This one is this much instruction and no code. So you get to write the code from scratch. Feel free to use the code from the previous program assignments, but imagine it will take you longer. Is it on key learning? Or it's on TD. All three. You get to do all three. And by the way, if anyone's interested in the blackjack, in terms of handling the natural 21, Thanks to Bruno, I have a solution. So if you want to hear about it, there's a nice, there's a nice one too. If you just change your state, what your state? Well, yeah, I was considering that. No, no, we're not allowed to change it. Any, we can do a change the state representation, but that's cheap. But what's the next solution we have? To Let me. I get a hand. I'll talk to uh, Daniel, and then I'll tell you. It's not that. It requires a lot of state. What? It requires a lot of state. I mean, I couldn't even come up with a, a trivia if statement that would work. Here's here's my quick description of it. If you hit, then, then you can't ever stick. So you in the hit, kind of keep keep going. And, is that right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you hit, uh, you can only, uh, your hit algorithm, sorry, you reach terminal state after hitting if you're 21 or above. Yeah, if you're 21 or above. So if you're 21, in the hit state, Keep going and see what's happened with the dealer. And then in the stick, you know it's a natural 21. So I thought it was very clever. That's clever. That's so yeah. clever. Yeah. Uh, I thought about that the way too long.